Bible says it's 6.30, so we're going to get started. We might have more people show up a little bit later, but thanks for coming to our fourth advanced class on Revelation that we call Discovering Its Curious Numbers, Words, Places, and Things. Um, hopefully this has been helpful to you. Yes. Yeah, a little bit interesting, if, if not uh, downright profound. <laughs> so, <laughs> so tonight we're going to be looking at the last of the four topics, the, the curious things in Revelation. But before we do, uh, let me just uh, give you a couple announcements, two or three announcements. Number one, um, this is the last of the classes. We're going to take a three-week uh, break at least from this format uh, for you know next week and then Palm Sunday and then Easter. The small groups are also um, not going to be meeting these next couple of weeks after this one. So that's just to, just to let you know that. And the second thing is that um, uh, the this prayer meeting that has started in the East Room is going to continue every Wednesday night all the way through Easter and beyond. So next Wednesday night, if you're looking for something to do and you want to have some fellowship, uh, join the prayer meeting over on uh, the other side of the building and um, you'll have a great time praying. So that's number two. Number three, um, we really enjoyed the worship director this weekend. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> when it rains, it pours. We have a, an executive pastor candidate that we've been interviewing also uh, through Zoom. And he and his wife are coming Palm Sunday. His name is uh, Christopher White. His wife's name is Christine. And uh, they're up in Oregon right now. He's 20, he has 20 years experience as an, as an executive pastor, three different churches. You know, everybody's just tracking um, perfectly with him. What a great couple. She has a ministry to, um, you know, just um, kids that have uh, special needs and other things. And she's been a missionary. It's just a really great couple. So you want to meet them on Palm Sunday. They're named Christopher and Christine White. So um, watch out for that. Um, and so that, I think those are the two announcements for tonight. Um, let me just pray and we'll start out uh, the, the lesson after that. Lord, thanks for these uh, Wednesday nights where we can learn and grow and think and be inspired. We really can't get enough of your word. It's going to take us our entire lifetimes to even scratch the surface. And when we do this, Lord, we just see how profoundly good you are and how rich your word is to us. It's our food, it's our strength, it's our protection, it's our shield. It's everything that we need. And so we thank you for this group tonight. We ask your blessing on our gathering. Jesus, we know you're here. Where two or three are gathered in your name, you are in our midst. So thank you for being here. May whatever we do and say tonight be pleasing to you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. So <clears throat> I titled this one, 12 Curious Things in Revelation, Artifacts and Concepts. So we're going to go through the, these 12 different things one by one, and I'll point out a few interesting things about them. I picked them out because they were either unique to Revelation or just really cool, one of the two. <laughs> but um, hopefully you'll, you'll, uh, you'll appreciate them. And the first one on page one is something that you probably would have guessed would be among the top 12 leading candidates for a curious thing of the month, and it is the throne. And you're going to see this word throne in, the new, in the Revelation 40 times. It's only mentioned 55 times in the entire New Testament. 40 of them are in Revelation. As a matter of fact, you run into the first time that the word throne is mentioned in verse 4 of chapter 1, that the seven spirits are before the throne, and then you run into it a lot in chapter 4, and you see that verse down at the bottom of page 1, at once I was in spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne, and then around the throne, and from the throne, and before the throne, and here we go, we're off to the races. To, uh, with, with this idea of throne. So this is the first thing that smacks us in the face as we read this great book, and you're, you're going to be wondering well, what's, what this is all about. And so quite, quite simply, what, what a throne was, 
Um, and this is not rocket science. A throne was a royal seat upon which a sovereign sat. And if you look at, in a concordance with, uh, on the word throne in the Old Testament, you'll see the word sat almost in every uh, occasion that you see the word uh, throne. So that a throne is not a throne unless someone's sitting on it. So that's, that's something that's interesting. It's a symbol of power of the king. I'm sure you knew that, and of his kingdom. And it's the place from which he ruled. So the king would sit on his throne. He would hear reports from his subjects. He would make decrees. He would do business. He would send people out. He would do everything on his throne. It usually had, I was going to bring one in, it usually had like a footstool. And you have countless references to the throne in the Old Testament. Isaiah 6.1, I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne, high and lifted up in the train, his train of his robe filled the temple. And then Isaiah 66.1, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. Where's the house that you're going to build for me? Where's the place of my rest? Psalm 45, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of righteousness. So that's that's the word throne. And in, in, the, Greek, in the Greek culture back there, and, and I want you to go there tonight, pretend you are living in uh, Turkey, in the western part of Turkey. You are a Greek speaker. You were brought up there. You're part of the Gentile race. You weren't brought up in Judaism. So the churches in that area were all Gentile churches. There were Jewish Christians also, but most of them were Gentile churches. So you had... You had different ways of thinking about things. And so as a non-Jewish person, you would have thought of a throne just the same way that the Jews thought of a throne as someone for a sovereign, something for a sovereign to sit on. What does it mean in Revelation? Well, it, it represents power and authority and dominion, God's power, authority, and dominion over all the universe, right? It represents majesty and glory of God's divine presence, and it's central to the book. So you see that little drawing at the top on both of those uh, whiteboards there. Everything is pointing to it. The throne is central. Everyone's around it. Someone is in it. I mean, everything kind of moves in that direction. So out of this throne, this central place, God is going to rule the universe. So that's the number one thing, the throne. Okay, so let me just ask you, before we leave this page, why so much throne in this book? Because, because the Roman Empire thought that they were the authority. Yeah, and Caesar was on the throne. So when Jesus is uh, speaking these words to John, showing him these visions... Jesus, I think, is communicating first to John, then to the churches and the whole region. Actually, there's a different person on the throne, and his name is God. And so take that and put it in your pipe and smoke it or something. I don't know. But anyway, the throne was the central part of this vision of Revelation. You're going to see this, number one. Number two, page two. Long robe. Long robe. This is one word, and the word is poderes. Poderes. It's only used one time in the Bible. In Revelation 1.13, in the midst of the lamp stands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a, uh, a golden sash around his chest. So, what is this poderas, and why is it called that? First of all, what is a podiatrist? A foot, a foot doctor. So what do you think a poderas is? Something that, touches your toes. Something that touches your toes, yes. It is a long robe down to your feet. That's one word in Greek, poderas. And you see a picture of someone in the poderas there on page two. This is actually an image of a very famous statue in the town of Delphi in Greece. And those of us who were on the trip, Marianne and others, that back in, yeah, Sharon, back in uh, 2018, 19 of us went to Greece on a uh, 
couple week trip around the different sites in Greece and we saw this person, we saw this very famous statue in the museum there in Delphi and his name is the charioteer. He's a bronze statue. He dates back to about 475 BC and you notice he's wearing this padaris and do you notice that he has a band high up on his chest there and you can't really see it without a magnifying glass but he has a diadem around his head. A diadema, it it's means tied around. It's a little band that means he's a victor. And he's actually holding in his hand there, you can't say, see this, but he's holding reins. Reins to the horses on a chariot. And that's why his name is the charioteer. And um, so there you have this idea of this long flowing robe that down, reaches down to his, his feet. Uh, and that's what the Poderas was there. You see that on, on the page. What does it signify? Well, if you were a Jewish person, you would say, well, of course, that's the high priest. That's what the high priest wore in the Old Testament. I know my scriptures. I know my Hebrew Bible. I could give you verse, uh, chapter and verse of where that is. But remember, these people were not Jewish. So what did the Greeks, what did the Greek people think that this was? Well, in the Greek culture, they didn't have only priests, they had king priests. So the king priest was the combination of a king and a priest in one person. The Jews never had that. The Jews had priests and then they had kings, but they never had king priests. But if you go back to um, Genesis chapter 14, you know the story of Abram and Melchizedek. You know the story of Melchizedek? So Melchizedek was a king priest. He was king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, and he actually came out and met Abraham after this warfare that uh, Abraham saved his nephew out of and blessed, and Abraham blessed him. So who was the higher one in that picture? Well, it was Melchizedek. So this is what Melchizedek would have worn back in the day, this long gown that reaches down to the, to the, to the feet. But more than this, this was the special dress of the, of the mythological god Apollo. And Apollo was thought of as the sun god. And he rode the chariot of the sun from morning till evening across the sky. So when you looked up and you saw the sun, you said, that must be Apollo riding his chariot until sundown. So that was what you visualized when you were uh, a Greek person growing up in that culture. So then you ask, okay, fine, what about the sash? What about the golden sash and why is it high up on his chest? And it's not intuitively obvious why that was. But then you have to understand that Apollo was also the god of music. And he, his favorite instrument was the harp. And as we're going to find out in a minute, he got the golden sash so he could play his harp and attach it to the sash. So that's why he has that sash high up on his, on his chest. So when when John is writing to the churches about the Son of Man walking in the midst of the golden lampstands, wearing a poderas, a very, very specific Greek word, they go, I know exactly what that is. He's the real Apollo. He's the real S-O-N. He's the real son. And so they could identify with him in that way. I think that is pretty cool. Page three. Speaking of harps... What is a harp? A harp is a kathara, which sounds a lot like guitar. <laughs> Dick, amen, just preach it. Yeah, a, a kitara is where we get the word guitar. Yeah, and if you look at the drawing here, you see two of these harps. They're, they're, this, they're this thing about this big. You can hold it on your arm. And the, actual, the little thing above it is a pick. They called it a plectron. A plectron where they pluck the strings. Yeah, so that was what they used to, uh, to play the, the harps. Um, Triangle-shaped stringed instrument. It was not the harp that you see in the symphony orchestra with this woman who is really skilled. Sometimes it's called a zither. It had seven or 11 strings and was held in place high on the, on the chest with that strap. So now you know 
all about the strap. What do you think the harp signifies in Revelation? Well, in the Old Testament anyway, harps were the traditional instruments that were used to sing psalms of praise. You would sing them on the harp. Here's Psalm 133. Shout for joy in the Lord, O your righteous. Praise befets the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. So praise is, uh, is rising to God when people are playing their guitars. And uh, it's even the same today. Chapter 5, the elders are going to be leading praise. You see this vision in chapter 5. We're going to come back to that later on where they're gathered around the throne. They all have harps. What did you think have harps in, 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 in heaven? You thought these fat cherubs or <laughs> angels or somebody else was playing harps. No, it is the elders playing harps uh, surrounding the throne. And then in chapter 15, you have another picture of harp players. They are the overcomers who are standing there and they're leading hymns of victory with their harps. And so there you have that verse at the bottom of page three. And I saw those who had conquered the beast with harps of God in their hands and they sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And then my favorite, one of my favorite King James verses is Revelation 14, 3. It's not on this page, but I have it memorized. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. <laughs> you, you, have three, you have three harps in one phrase. I just love it. And they sang a new song. Okay, so we're not going to harp on this any longer. <laughs> but, it, but this leads us to our next word, and that is musicians. Again, only used one time in the New Testament in Revelation 18.12. And the word for musicians is musicos. That's very logical, isn't it? And, and this is fascinating. You may not know this. Who the musicians were. The Greek god Apollo was the leader of the muses. Have you heard of the muses? The muses were nine mythological goddesses who inspired the mortals to create artistic works. And there are nine different women, well, not women, there are nine different goddesses, they're female, and one of them was lyric poetry, the other one was dance, another one was music, another one was um, odes and serious poetry, one was tragedies, somebody else was, uh, was some kind of artistic works. And so the muse, the, the Greeks thought that these muses were inspiring them. I don't think that. I just think God is inspiring the creative people. But anyway, they thought it was muses. And so musicians were people who were dedicated to the arts of the muses. They were musicians. I really love that. What the musicians did, they wrote poetry, played instruments. We just talked about that. And some performed music um, that was given for the pleasure and enjoyment of other people. And what do you think a museum was? It was a school of arts and learning and a temple for the muses. So when you go into a museum today, you see a lot of the artwork that was created by inspired people who were probably not inspired by the muses since it's all fictitious, but they were probably inspired by God to create um, beautiful artwork. God is the consummate artist, right? Mm -hmm. He really is. So all the inspiration comes from him. And, and the only one time that it's used in the, in the New Testament um, is in this verse in Revelation 18. It's about Babylon's fall and says, so will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down <clears throat> in the sound of harpists, and musicians and flute players and trumpeters will be heard no in you no more. Which, before we turn the page, brings us to the final question, who in the Bible was the father of music? This is for extra credit on the final. Who 
in the Bible was the father of music. Yes, that's correct. Excellent. Lamech's son, Jubal. Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, okay? And then Genesis chapter 4 gives you the line of Cain, his descendants, and you go down eight generations, and you arrive at Lamech, who is like the super testosterone Hulk Hogan of the Old Testament. Yeah, if you read Genesis chapter 4, he comes across as this guy who drives a monster truck. I got two wives, and you know, and he's just like, yeah, we could do a sermon on that, but we're not going to. Laman took two, here, let me just read some of this. And Lamech took, took two wives. The name of the one was Ada. She was doing cosmetics the whole time. And the name of the other was Zillah. Ada bore Jabel. He was the father of all who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all of those who play the lyre and the pipe. All the way back in Genesis chapter 4, you had music. Okay, so they probably rock and roll, probably heavy metal. Yeah, who knows what they, I think Lamech was playing heavy metal for sure. Yeah, read about Lamech and you'll get it. Page 5. White robe. I know, this is advanced. White robe. What is a white robe? It's a white robe. The Greek word for robe is stole. And the, and the Greek word for white is leukos. So a white robe is an outer garment. You can see a picture of it there. A cloak, a mantle, often made of fine linen, which was probably always white. And it just covered the outside of your body. Um, a stole, w w this is what it was called a stole originally, but a stole anymore is this thing that you see on graduation day where someone has a cap and gown in this long ribbon thing that's four inches wide, that's called a stole. Or if you go into a high church, like a Roman Catholic church or an Anglican church, or even in our church, our Methodist church in Pennsylvania, our pastor wore these long garments down to the foot. Black, he was black usually. And he had this, these, these colorful bands. That was, that was the word stole, what it means today. And you have this word mink stole, that went out like 50 years ago. But vestments, graduation, those are what the, the stole has, has become now. Leukos, white. What is leukemia? Yeah, it's leukos hemia. Luke, leukos is white, hemia blood. It's the disease of white blood, too many white blood cells. So uh, leukos means white. And you're going to see a lot of white things in Revelation, not only just the white robe, but you see white robe seven times in Revelation. He who overcomes is going to walk with me in white. And the overcomers get white robes, and it's mentioned seven different times. White signifies three things. Can you see them on the bottom of page five? Purity. In, in uh, Sardis, those um, who are not defiled will walk with me in white. Yeah. And that's a color of victory, too. Um, in, in Revelation 7, 13, and 14, one of the elders addressed me saying, Who are these clothes in white robes? These are the ones coming out of great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So you have, you have white robes there. One final thing at the bottom of, of this page, and I think this is kind of fascinating. Do you think that you have a part to play in your own salvation? Or is it all God? I believe we have a part to play. Initially, when the gospel is preached to you, you have a choice whether you're going to receive that gospel and you're going to receive Jesus as your personal Savior or not. You can choose to receive him or you can say, oh, no, thank you. So that's, that's a choice you, you have to make. 
There are some belief systems, even Christian belief systems, that says, no, 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 it's all God's providence, especially the, the people that believe in, in pure predestination. I think Calvin is thinking that, that you really don't have a role to play. It's just that God picked you. You can't even do anything about it. But this verse kind of tends to, to disagree with that. They have washed their robes. Who is washing their own robes? Is it God? No. They have washed their robes and they have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They have responded to the gospel and said, Lord, I am a sinner. I need saved. I need to be washed from, your, from my sins by your blood. And we all know this. What can wash away my sin? Nothing, Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah, we're going to get out our guitars and play that one. But yeah, they've washed their own robes. So this to me is another verse that just convinces us we have a part to play and that we have a free will we can receive Christ. Of course, he, I mean, it's a deep subject, but he puts that in our heart in the beginning. But anyway, so there you have that on page five. Page six, white stone. White stone. Cephos, leucos. You already know leucos is white. This word cephos means pebble. It's a teeny pebble. I should have brought one. The word is only used three times in the New Testament, twice in Revelation. And uh, it really is symbolic of a couple of things. First is, back in the day... In this place in Greece and in Turkey, they used to use white pebbles to vote. So if you want to vote for something, that's a white pebble. If you want to vote against it, that's a black pebble. And even in the courts, they, the, the judge would award you a stone if he acquitted you, a white one. Or if you were guilty and heading for jail, you got a black stone. Yeah. So we have, I think this has kind of uh, come all the way down to us, the bad guys wear black, the white guys wear white. I mean, you have the cowboys and all of that kind of thing. So yeah, this symbolism of white versus black, good versus bad, um, and also and so on. The white pebble used for ballot, uh, ballot and voting, Acts 26.10. So uh, Paul is giving his defense before Agrippa, and he says, I myself was convinced that I ought to do so many things opposing the name of Jesus. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priest, but when they were put to death, I cast my pebble, my vote against them. So there you have it right there in Acts 26.10. He made his vote with the white pebble. There was some idea that it could also mean a token given to athletes that won. They could have a white stone meant approval or a ticket used to admit guests into feasts. So that's another definition that some uh, scholars believe uh, could apply here as well. So it may mean for us God's approval. I think that's the number one meaning. God approves you. He gives you a white stone. Or our victory in Christ, um, or an invitation to the wedding feast of the Lamb. you got to bring your ticket. You have to have a white robe to get in. Did you know that? That's in Revelation. You have to give a white robe to get into the wedding feast. Or maybe that's in Matthew, one of the two. But you have to have, be sure to get it, get it cleaned, bring it with you um, to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Yeah, so that's the white stone. Page number seven. Ha! Huh. A fayali. A fayali, golden bowl. Fayali, that's the Greek word. It's, it's used... Only in the, in the book of Revelation, this word, it's used in there 12 times. What was a fiali? It is a very narrow, thin dish with, with an indentation in the center. This is not one. This is a lid to something. But you can see the indentation there. This was purposely made so that your thumb would go over the edge and the two middle fingers would go in the middle where that indentation is. It's used for votive offerings through libations, which are, which are liquids. So 
when you want to give a, a drink offering to God, you fill it up with oil and pour it out. And you usually pour it on the ground. But you see how it, it's like palming a basketball. I mean, it's just, it's just right there in your hand. So this is a very unique thing the Greeks would have known uh, when that word was used in Revelation exactly what it was for. So it, 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 can, it connoted to them, it's going to be something of worship. It's going to be an offering. There's, there's purpose to that thing. A fiali was a shallow, specially designed offering dish, curved sides, you saw that. Wine or oil were slowly poured out on the ground as libations. They signified two things. The elders in Revelation chapter 5 had these things in their hands. They had a harp in one hand and this in the other hand. Like, okay, that's really interesting. And their fiales were full of incense. And the, the incense was being burned and the smoke went up. Or you could have fiales that are filled with God's wrath. And that's in Revelation chapter 15, which is poured down. It, it, it served uh, both purposes. And you have both of these in Revelation. So when you see this curious object, you're thinking offering, you're thinking worship, you're thinking incense. And many, there's many verses in the, in the Old Testament and the New that talk about incense being an analogy, a symbolism for prayers. Psalm 141.2, let my prayer be counted as incense before you and the lifting of my hands as an evening sacrifice. Revelation 8.4, and the smoke of the incense rose before God in the hand of the angel. So a sweet savor is rising up. Even as we pray here on earth right now, this is a sweet savor to God in heaven. These prayers are rising, and that's the whole idea there. And so the elders are involved in that process in Revelation 5.8, and then in Revelation 16, God is going to be pouring out these, these fiali on the earth. Okay, one final thing. This is not a really good example because it's about twice as high as what it should be. It's very shallow. Mm -hmm. That says, when God pours out his wrath, it's not very much. Why is that important? Because wrath is not for wrath. Wrath is so that you can repent. So he just pours out a little bit hoping that people will repent and will come to him. And, and all these different um, pouring outs of the, of the bowl. We call them bowls. But when you think of a bowl, you think of this. This is what you think of God's wrath. Yeah, that's not exactly what it is. It's not a bowl. King James calls it a vial. When I think of a vial, I think of like a, some kind of a vase for a rose or something. But that, that would not be what people at, in, in that time would have thought of when they thought of this uh, fiali here. Um, so when it talks in, in chapter 16, all these bowls, the word is fiali? Mm -hmm. Every time it's used 12 times. It's a golden bowl. Yeah, it's called a golden bowl. So when you think golden bowl, you think of something else. You think of a bowl made out of gold, but it's one of these made out of gold. Yeah, if you look in the picture, you see the, a, a, a view, aerial view of the thing. Um, yeah, so you'll see a lot of this in the Old Testament, the pouring out of li these libations. Jacob in Genesis 35 so made a pillar there and poured out a libation on it, a, a drink offering on it. Uh, it was a symbol of uh, offering something to God, one of, the, one of the offerings. Page number eight. Furlong. When's the last time you used that word? Horse racing. Yeah, we don't live in Kentucky, but furlong. You have the word furlong in the King James Version. You have it in the New King James Version. You have it in the American Standard Version, but you don't have it in the ESV. You have the word stadion. The word stadion. And the verse that, that I show you on page 8, he measured the city with a rod, 12,000 stadia, which is plural of stadion. Everybody knows that. And what was a stadion? Well, it was a measure of distance. One-eighth of a mile. 
660 feet, which is 200 meters, which is exactly the length of the race course at Olympia, Greece for the Olympic Games. And there's a picture of it there, and you have a picture of it on your page. So the race course for the 100 yards dash was really a 200 meter dash, and they lined up down at this end, four or five people, men, and they lined up and they ran straight ahead. And it was a wide, I don't know how wide it was, maybe a third of the, of the width of this room, but there was no corners. It was just a long rectangle, but when they got down to the end, there was a post, and they ran around the post, and they ran back, depending on how many laps they wanted to run in the race. If it was, if it was a 200-meter dash, it was just one to the end. And there was no corners at all, and you can see, if you can see on the map there, the drawing, you have lines around it that represents height. So it was like, it was like a raised stadium would be, and people would stand around that, and they would look down in this long rectangular track that was being used as, the, as a race course in Olympia and other places around there. When we were in Delphi, I don't know if you remember this. Do you remember that? It was way at the top. Did you go up there? You did. You were like one of the few people that went to the very top of the mountain when we were in Delphi. You could go up higher and higher and higher. And up at the top was where the stadium was. And you could see it. It's still there today. And uh, it's, it, it was this thing 200 meters long. And that's where you get this idea of stadium was the place of the stadia. So there you have that. Um, and they have, they, they've actually brought this into golf. I don't know if you know this, that the PGA Tour now builds what they call stadium golf courses, where they lower the fairways so that you can stand above the players and look down on them, just like you're in a stadium. I think, I don't know. It's just, I, I, really, I like that. So there you go. 440, so in, in, in uh, 144 BC, they put curves in the stadiums. And so you have the stadium in Athens, Greece. The actual stadium that was used back in 144 BC is there, and it has curved corners, but it's very narrow. It's not like these tracks you go on that are really wide corners. It's just really narrow, and then the really sharp turns at the end. 50,000 seats. You can go to Athens today and see it. It's there today. Um, they refurbished it in 1870. They had the first Olympics there of the modern era in Greece. I don't know what date it was in the 19, early 1900s. Maybe it was 1870. So anyway, that's the stadium. And that's only used in Revelation. Page number nine. This is cool. This is cool. Heaven. We talked about this before in one of our words, heaven, or oranos, heaven. And we said, I think it was during the week of the words, we talked about there being three different ideas of heaven. One is that it meant the atmosphere surrounding the planet. So that would be the first heaven, the sky. The birds of the air have nests. That word air there in that verse is oranos, the same thing. It's the second heaven would be the universe, like from there on up to where uh, God's heaven is. And then the third heaven is the heaven of heavens. We get this from Paul's writings where he, saw, he talks about going to the third heaven. So that's kind of how he understood it. Um, but there's also this very interesting idea that you find in the King James Bible. So in your King James Bible, Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, that's the first verse. And then you go to verse 6, and in verse 6 you have, and God said, let there be a firmament. That's in the King James Version, right? in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters, and it was so, and God called the firmament heaven. Tell me about that. Tell me about that. What is that? Have you ever wondered what the word firmament meant? 
it, meant, it means hard surface. That's what the word firmament meant, means. In the Greek version of the Old Testament, it's the word stereoma. That means solid structure. So this is a firmament. And it's surrounding the planet. And when you look up, it's colored blue. You're looking at the inside of that thing. And God put all the stars in it. And then he put the planets in it. I mean, this is the concept that the Hebrews had back in the day, that when they looked up, they saw this expanse, and they thought it was firm. So they called it a firmament. And it divided the rain clouds from the water down below. So when it rained, God opened the window and it came straight down because it was heavy. The water was heavy and it poured down there. So even you have that idea in Noah's Ark, the windows of heaven were opened and it came down. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. So do you see that picture? That is a picture of somebody crawling through a hole in the firmament. That is awesome. I don't know when this was done, a long time ago, but you see all the stars? They are embossed on the inside of this hermetically sealed hard shell. It's like a gigantic M&M, and it just surrounds the planet. This was their thought. This was pre-round globe Earth, right? In their understanding. I know I'm blowing your mind totally. But, I, but that's where this word came from. I mean, you mean, so that's how they thought of it back in the day. I mean, certainly it's not that because we know now that it doesn't, it doesn't really work that way, but that's what it really meant. Um, and then you have this idea. I think there's an, am I losing you? Or this is kind of fun. You have this idea that heaven was opened. You have it seven times. You have it in Revelation 19.11. John says, I saw heaven opened. Saw heaven opened. That meant the hard shell was there, but then there was a hole. Or the door opened. <laughs> I saw heaven opened. So Jesus, in John chapter 151, Nathaniel comes to him, and they're having this conversation, and Nathaniel says, how did you know me? And Jesus says, well, I saw you sitting under the fig tree. And Nathaniel says, you are the son of God. There's no question about this. We are good. And Jesus says, is, is that all? I mean, is that, is that going to, he says, is that really impressed you? But I'm going to show you more things. I'm going to show you heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Ha. Huh. And then you have Jesus himself. When he gets baptized, he sees heaven opened opened and he can see all the way to heaven and then you have Stephen at his, at his stoning he sees heaven opened and then you have Peter at the house of Cornelius he sees heaven opened and then you have Ezekiel in the Old Testament he sees heaven open so you have all these ideas of um, of heaven opening up of course this is symbolic it doesn't really mean that in um, but what does it mean then it means that we now see that there's no barriers. We can see all the way to heaven. So in Stephen's case, he visualized, this, he probably saw him, the Son of God standing, Jesus standing at the right hand of God. We get a glimpse of heaven. There's no barriers. We, this really produces hope in the hearers. Anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting stuff. Page 10. We're tracking. Now, so that's heaven. How about hell? Okay, let me just say right here. Hell is not what you think it is. Okay, let me just start with that. You have three different words that the old King James Version all translated as the same word, hell. The word hell actually is not a Greek word. It's an, it's an English word from a long time ago. It's not a Greek word. You have the concept of the lake of fire. That's at the end of Revelation, and that's what you would, and that's called hell in the King James Version of the Bible. 
It's used five times in the New Testament, only in Revelation 19, 20, and 21. And the lake of fire is the eternal separation from God, okay? So that is what you think hell is, and it probably is. Number two, the second word is Gehenna, G-E-H-E-N-N-A. It is a Hebrew word, probably. It means the Valley of Hinnom. And that was a valley right beside Jerusalem where they burned trash 24-7. They incinerated all the junk and garbage in the city in a valley. And every city had one of these valleys. And they would throw trash in it. They would throw carcasses. They would throw all the, I don't know, wrappers from your candy bar, whatever you had back in the day. And so the Valley of Hinnom. And so when Jesus is talking about this eternal separation from God, he uses this valley, which happens to be right there, and says, well, it's just like that. It's going to be very uncomfortable for you. Um, and so he's, that's, that's going to be the second idea of, of an eternal separation from God. The third is the word Hades. Hades is not hell. It's not. It is, it is a pic, I pictured it on the page there. It is a, a concept that comes from Greek mythology that Jesus happens to grab. So Jesus in chapter Luke 16, go, go home and read it tonight, Luke 16, one th uh, let's see, 19 through 31 is the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. And Lazarus is this poor guy. He's laying outside the gates of the rich man's house. He's got sores all over. The dogs are licking him, making him feel good. And he dies. And then the rich man dies. And then it says that they were both taken down. You have this direction down to Hades. So Hades was, was the concept of an underworld. And the word Hades actually comes from Greek mythology. That was the name of the god of the underworld. His name was Hades. And then they just called his place Hades. It just became known as Hades. And Hades had two sections. A pleasant section that was pleasant. And then it had an un unpleasant section that was unpleasant. And then between them was a chasm, which is called the bottomless pit in Revelation. And you call it the abyss. There was some, a movie called The Abyss one time that was really cool. So there's this idea that there's this abyss that's separating them. So Lazarus is, is over and he's in, he's in the pleasant section and it's cool. And Abraham's there and he's in Abraham's bosom and they're having some fellowship. And hey, how was your life? How was really good? How was yours? And they're just having this good conversation. Meanwhile, the rich man's over on the other side burning he said, would you please come over and get me? I can't get you because you're too far. Well, at least send word back to my brothers that they should uh, straighten up or they're going to end up here with me. So you had this idea. Of what's, and Jesus picks this as the picture of the underworld. And I like to think of Hades as a motel. It is temporary. It is a motel that God uses temporarily to house the righteous and unrighteous dead until Jesus comes. So in the past, in the Old Testament times, you had Hades there. And you had the unpleasant section and you had the pleasant section. And it wasn't until Jesus came that the motel got emptied because you know that he has the key of death and of Hades, so he's got the keys. So the idea was, in when Jesus died, he spent three days under the earth. Matthew 20, uh, 40, 12, 40 says this, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So. This is not the only interpretation. I'm telling you what a number of scholars believe happens here. So in the Old Testament times, before Christ came, before Christ died on the cross, you had these two different parts of this, of the underworld, if you want to think of that, the place of the dead. And so Jesus, in this three days that he is in the visiting the hearts of the earth, he visits Hades. And Ephesians 4, 7 through 9 says this, 
But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Therefore the scripture says, Having ascended to the heights, he led captive those who, have, those who were taken captive, and he gave gifts of men. Now this, that he ascended, what is it except that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Now for me, what this means was when Jesus visited the underworld, he went to the pleasant section, to the Old Testament saints who were, who were in this pleasant area. They were just there waiting and he said, okay, we are leaving now, pack up your backpacks, we're heading out. And there he took them to heaven at that point. So now today, that pleasant section is no longer occupied by anybody. It's only the unpleasant section that is, and that is the people that are waiting for the final judgment. So now when you and I die, we don't go to, ha we don't go to Hades. We don't go down, we go up. So Stephen didn't look down when he was getting stoned. He looked up to heaven. So when Jesus died and rose again, he opened the gates of heaven, and he opened heaven for all of the Old Testament saints and now all of the New Testament saints who are then waiting there for him. So we got into some theology. I don't know if you like that or not. I think it's really interesting. Two more, and then, and then I'll stop for questions. Sorry that I'm talking so much. Pearly gates. Have you ever thought about that? What's that? What's up with that? What's up? Well, there's 12 pearls. What, okay, well, what does it mean? Why pearly gates? Why not ivory gates? Why not silver gates? Why not wood gates? Why not, I don't know. Well, yeah, or you could say that the church is the pearl of great price. So let me just, this is cool. What a pearl is. A pearl is produced when an oyster is wounded by a grain of sand. Huh. The oyster secretes an organic substance, nacre, that coats the particle. The layers of nacre harden and form a precious pearl. This is a good interpretation. I'm just going to tell you that. Jesus, the oyster, lived among us, the sea, and was wounded by us on the cross, the sand. Out of his pierced side flowed blood to cleanse us, and water to give us life. Thus Christ's salvation is required for people to enter the new Jerusalem. That's why it's a pearly gate. Pearl is a symbol of Christ's death on the cross to save you from your sins. So if you come to the new Jerusalem, you're knocking on the door, and they say, are you saved? You say, no. Well, you're not coming in. <laughs> you are not coming in this pearly gate. There you go. Finally, number 12, and then we're going to stop for questions. Well, the hour's gone already. Freshly slain. This word slain is used seven times in the, in the New Testament. All of it, all these times are in John's writing, six times in Revelation, one time in 1 John. In Revelation 5, 6. And behold, the throne and four living creatures, and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been just slain. So the form of that word there means freshly slain. I mean, it was just, it just happened. So let me tell you the story of Revelation 4 and 5 as I close here tonight. So Revelation 4, John's on the island of Patmos. He's minding his own business. He hears a voice behind him, and he looks up, and it's the same voice he heard in chapter 1, he, and he sees a door opened in heaven, and the voice says, come up here. Okay, does he have a choice? Probably not so much. So he comes up to heaven. He sees God sitting on the throne. There's four living creatures around the throne. There's 24 elders. They have harps and so on. He sees all of these, and then... He sees the Spirit of God before the throne. And at the very end of this scene, you have praise going up. And the praise is for the Creator God. Worthy are you, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. 
and by your will they existed and were created. So is God the creator? Yes, he is. He's getting praise for that aspect. And he's surrounded by his creatures. The four living creatures, the elders, all of his creatures are surrounding them and they're all praising him. There's only one problem. Where's the son? He's gone. He's not AWOL. He's away with leave. Where is he? He's on the planet. Jesus is about ready to go to the cross. He's not in heaven at that time. You just have the Father and you have the Spirit. The Son is down below on, on earth. He goes to the cross. He's the Lamb of God. He's killed and then he ascends to the heavens. And then chapter 5 starts. It says this. And I saw at the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a megaphone, a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look on it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and look on it. And then one of the angels said to me, Stop crying. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a freshly slain lamb. He just arrived after he ascended. He's just been there five minutes. And, he, and as it had as it just been slain with seven eyes and so on. And he took the scroll out from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and the golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain. So I think this is fascinating. We praise the Creator God for His creation, and we praise the Redeeming Lamb for His redemption. And both of these are pictured there. And what John is really seeing is he's seeing the ascension from up in heaven. He's seeing, here He comes. He's coming up toward them. And there He is, the freshly slain Lamb. I don't know. That, to me, that's really fascinating stuff. Twelve artifacts, twelve concepts. There's probably... 20 more, but we are completely out of time. Let me stop here and ask now, are there any questions about this, about anything else? It's like a fire hose. Yes. The word hell is not in the Bible. I mean, it's in the King James Version, but not, it's not a Greek word. So the word hell in the Bible could mean Hades. It could mean lake of fire. It could mean Gehenna. It can mean all those. So if you get the King James Bible, it, mean, it can mean all those three. The newer versions, like the ESV, they don't, I don't think they use the word hell either. They use, either use lake of fire Hades or Gehenna. Mm -hmm. I think that's correct. So is yeah. the fire the second judgment place? Yeah, I mean it's like that. We don't know exactly what that means. I'm sure it's got symbolism associated with it. Yeah. That's possible. Yeah, it could be figurative. Yeah, clearly there's no hard shell. Like the astronauts don't hit it when they go up there, or as far as we know. Or maybe they went through the hole. The door was open, the windows were open. Yeah, I don't know. It could be a different dimension. Yes. Yeah, that's a, that's an. Yes, that's right. That's the spiritual dimension. Absolutely. Yeah, we probably have. 
we have, probably have eyes that can see at that time. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Somehow, I don't want to be contrary, but it's confusing to me. Since I understand the, uh, this all happens to John at the end of the scriptures, just after these things, a voice from heaven has come up to him. And then, I mean, Christ was slain before the churches, before the church age. So to have a freshly, him being there right then, that's a little, um, it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense, but it was a vision. It wasn't like a timeline. It wasn't, a, yeah, it wasn't like a timeline. Yeah, that's a good point. It was a vision, he saw that. So, so to him that was making sense, to him then. Yeah. What do you mean it doesn't make sense to you? Well, it, yeah, it's it not strictly a, yeah, so I know what you mean. Thinking chronologically. Yeah, you know, if you think chronologically, it doesn't make sense. But, it but if you think just from a vision standpoint, it does make sense. Because in the first, in chapter 4, the sun isn't there. But in, where is he? He's got to be somewhere. And then in chapter 5, he is there. If you think of, if you think of him as also the creator, because John says there's nothing that was created without him, nothing was made, he was there. Okay, yeah. There's, there's some theological nuance there, yeah, for sure. Anyway, other thoughts? Yes. That's a great question, and it isn't, no. Because the idea of purgatory is you died and you're a mess, so you need, you need to clean up your act before you get into heaven. And I'm going to help you by praying for you to get you out of there sooner, and I'm going to give money. Yeah, which is another story. We're not going there. But <laughs> the more money I give, the sooner you leave, which is kind of interesting. So that, was, that wasn't until the 12th century. So in the 12th century A.D., the Catholic Church at that time came up with that idea. Might have, might have been a money-making deal. I don't know. But they came up with that idea of purgatory. But that's not biblical. Not biblical. Yeah, other questions? <laughs> I think this is interesting. Yeah. Well, go go read about it. Yeah. Go read about it. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for joining the class. I had a lot of fun. Hope you did too. <laughs> if you have questions, Ben Sobel's at <laughs> cypresschurch.org.